I'm Andrew Kallenberg from the Dufferin Farm Tour. We have been bringing you to Dufferin County Farms for over 20 years. Normally the farm tour consists of a day visiting a selection of diverse farms throughout Dufferin County, where we are able to go through the barns, talk to the farmers, pet the animals and learn about the challenges of agriculture. Due to the COVID pandemic, we were unable to do so in person this year, so we have put together a video that goes deep behind the scenes, showcasing a variety of farms. We would like to thank all of our host farms for their willingness to open their doors and for allowing us to watch them in action. We would also like to extend our appreciation to our sponsors who make this tour possible. We are continually amazed with their ongoing support year over year. Thank you to the Art of Storytelling for the production of this video and the wonderful visuals you are about to see. We hope that you will join us in person next fall for the 2022 Dufferin Farm Tour. I think that we live in one of the most beautiful places. Agriculture is the backbone economic driver in Dufferin County. A lot of people say it's a lifestyle. I don't look at it as such. It's a business decision. And I think one of the most wonderful things about farming in Dufferin County is the camaraderie between the farmers and the farms. We plant potato seed in April, May. We spend the summer watching those potatoes grow, making sure that they're healthy, hoping that there's enough rain, and just keeping a very good eye on them through the growing season, applying any products that need to be there for the plant's health. September, October, November, we will harvest those potatoes. So we have grown from a small operation back in the 1920s to where we are a major supplier to the chains here in Ontario. So right now we're planting soybeans, so they will be sold to Pioneer, a company that we actually sell seed for as well, for other farmers to grow next spring. So what's unique maybe about our operation is we do have the grain farm side of it. We also sell seed and fertilizer and crop protection products. We have a lot of great customers, whether it's a large dairy farms or that sort of thing, that we will come and do the work for them. They might do the tillage, but they ask us to come and plant it for them or harvest the crop because they don't want to have the capital cost tied up in large harvesting equipment. As far as crop rotation, we try not to ever do the same crop twice. We usually try to do a three-year rotation of corn, soybeans, then wheat. We try to make more than one stream of income because you don't know what's going to pay the bills at the end of the year. I love my job, I love working for myself, but there are a lot of challenges with farming as well. Sometimes you wonder with the, uh, with the capital infrastructure risk to it, it is, it's, uh, it's a choice. My husband started experimenting with ever-bearing strawberries that are planted on raised plastic beds. And that was a game changer for us because then we could start supplying some of the grocery stores. We literally grew up around the corner and we couldn't have chosen a, a better place to raise our families. When the opportunity came to buy this farm, we jumped at it, even though it was only seven acres at the time, we hoped and dreamed that it would turn back into a 100-acre farm, and we are so glad it did. I started growing more strawberries, so the home farm was something that got us going. Our little shed that was the woodshed quickly got to be too small when word got out that we had strawberries, and the strawberries were incredible. They weren't anything like California strawberries, and so we knew we were onto something there. I went through school for engineering and I liked engineering, but it wasn't where I wanted to hang my hat. And I haven't been able to run away from farming. I found myself taking over my dad's crop, um, my dad's fields that he had, and then looking for some more land on my own. This is a trellis system, so it's generally designed for a more intense crop that's easier to manage, so everything is forward facing, we're not working around a tree with ladders, it's it's all carried in that six, seven foot height range. I'm growing more food and I feel the pressure now more than I did before just because 
there's so many people coming into the store looking for that stuff and you feel like you're letting them down if you don't pull through with it. There's nothing better than, than growing a nice crop and presenting that in a nice store and giving that story. We have sheep and beef cattle. We've been farming here for 17 years. So most cattle in Ontario are fed grass, probably a majority of their life. So as, as they're born as calves, as they're raised to a farm like ours, then they would go on to a feedlot where they are fed stored grass, stored feed. Canada does export quite a bit of beef, so it's hard to say where the beef would go. A lot of it does stay in Ontario, and there's some really good local beef brands that, that identify Ontario product that can easily be found in the major grocery stores. Twice a day, I move them into the milking area. So the milking area is the holding area in the parlor. Look, I can milk eight cows at a time. So right now we're milking 52 cows. Then there's replacements after that. So that means the calves are the ones that are growing up and there's about 52 of those as well. I've been a farmer, I guess you could say probably my whole life. I was born here and I took over from my parents who started in 1978. I and mean, I started paying the bills in 2011. Dufferin County is home and it's always been home. Around here we're very fortunate that we have a lot of farmers that are about my age and that just it makes it more fun to farm and it makes it more challenging because a lot of them are really really good and so trying to keep up with them it makes it really worthwhile. We have about 400 ewes and their lambs. We try to provide as much of their feed as we can off of them grazing on pasture. We'll provide grass for them and we'll move them on to another field fairly shortly. So we're moving sheep every couple days to a new piece of grass. And that's sort of how we manage the nutrition of the grass as well as the soil health. We're hoping to have lots of litter on the surface. So we actually fed quite a bit of hay on here last winter and uh, the hay that we fed has been all eaten up by the soil organisms and we've got really good clumping of the soil here and lots lots and lots of roots and as far as the plants go we've got lots of lots of diversification we've got alfalfa we've got vetch we've got white clover we've got timothy grass we've got fescue we've got bluegrass We've even got some earthworms right near the surface in July, so that's doing pretty good. That right there is what good soil looks like. the newer tractors now they have GPS controllers with them so you'll if you're driving around you'll see a small beacon on top or that sort of thing so they will have auto guidance the planter out here right now it actually singulating every seed we have very little overlapping with seed there's 24 rows of corn planting but each row will actually shut off individually so there's never an overlap so it saves seed it saves fertilizer it's environmentally friendly as far as the sprayers the sprayers have section control on them now so whether it's herbicides or fungicides or fertilizer which are all very expensive nobody wants to put on any more than what they need to it makes it very efficient and very effective so I think the future of farming and technology is going to be um, changed vastly compared to what it is today Yes, yeah, so once we harvest the grain off the fields, then we'll bring them back to the elevator here as our focal point. If they need dried, we have a dryer here as well, so we can, uh, um, it's a propane dryer, so we can add heat to it, so we bring it down to uh, a moisture, a grain moisture that they will stay stable. They'll stay stable in the bins for a year. 
if the moisture is too high, then they could potentially rot. So we'll we'll uh, we'll bring them back here, make sure the grain, every load is is uh, checked for moisture and quality, and uh, any conditioning we need to do with cleaning or anything before they go into their storage uh, facilities. And then once they're uh, once they're here, we'll start shipping them out almost immediately. Um, we'll start with some movement because we don't have enough storage space for all for all the wheat, all the soybeans, and all the corn. So. We'll start uh, start shipping them out um, shortly after harvest, and then uh, some we might keep right through until this time the following year. We might store some grain for up to 12 months, and some will some will uh, will move out directly. So we contract at different times of the year, a for money flow, for different price um, price points, and that sort of thing. So uh, the market will pay you a little bit more to store it for until when they need it. So. When we're unloading, we normally know the quality that uh, comes in. We check every every load before dumping, and then we'll know if it goes to a has to go to a wet bin storage to get processed and dried, or if it's dry enough, then we can put it right into the into the long term storage. So. The planting and the harvest gets done with large machinery because there are many acres to be put in in a short amount of time, as well as harvesting. We only have a certain window of opportunity to make sure all our potatoes come out of the ground without any risk of frost. We need to take our potatoes that we harvest in the fall and store them on site in storage bins. We keep them at a cooler temperature that is climate controlled the potato is washed, polished, and then graded through our optical sorters. For years, Downey Farms had a manual way of grading and sorting our potatoes. And then recently, we improved our technology that helped make that job a lot easier, more efficient. So there are so many opportunities um, in farming now, especially as things are um, advancing. They always need to be serviced, they need to be updated. All your, all your electronic adjustments on these. You know, it's become very technical. We're often calling in people to fix the GPS system or update different programs. The feeding aspect of my operation is certainly state of the art. It's a hundred percent automated. It does everything based on how much the cows want to eat and when they want to eat it. And it goes around, it, it runs on its own, it's electric, battery operated, and if the cows need feed, that's when it goes back to its feed station and it makes more feed. It saved me a lot of labor, and the other thing that it does is it will only feed the cows once they finished what was already in front of them. We have basically eliminated, I would say, 99.9% .9 of all waste. Some of the things I was doing as far as grazing technology and things like that, the only way to get that information in the past was from books and you know maybe the odd speaker that you'd hear every year or so and now that information around the world is available daily through social media. Yeah, as far as technology, I think with the apps we have on our phone, you know, all this information is available, it's just a matter of harnessing it and, and kind of using it for good and, and, and getting good quality information that we can, we can make good educated decisions on. In the beginning, our strawberry you pick was always right here beside our house. So I think that in itself was different because when people came, my children were running around on the yard, our toys were on the yard and we got to know people. We had regular customers who would come because we grew up in the area. A lot of it started with friends and family. And I think we were known as a strawberry you pick patch that was family friendly. I know some other you picks have some more rules and regulations in place about children in the patch and the number of children and ages. And we always embraced bring as many kids as possible. We have five children of our own running around here, so we were always enthusiastic to see big families come and pick. I think that's important to consumers, that 
they know where their potatoes come from. People who've never been on farms before come up and visit us and we show them our facility and show them what we're doing here and it really hits home with them how important it is to support local. So this part of Downey Farms is our uh, recycling lagoon where we recycle the water from the water we use to wash the potatoes during the process inside. It runs through four different chambers that separates any sediment, goes through a cleaning process and then back through the wash plant again. In the background, you'll see piles of potatoes here that are getting ready to go to our food digester. Basically, these are potatoes that were unmarketable. We were not able to send it to our processing plant. These potatoes would either go to cattle feed or to our food digester. The remnants of the potato turns into fertilizer that we were able to use next year for our, our planting and growing season. If there's the idea out there that farmers don't care about the environment, that's just wrong because we don't have a choice. My parents passed it down to me. I'm going to pass it down to somebody else. The only way I can do that is if I take care of it. As a farmer, I am dependent on the environment in order to make a living. If I can't grow feed for my cows, then I can't milk cows. So at its most basic, I care about the environment and I care about my land because that's how I make my living. So if I don't do a good job, then I'm gonna go broke. If I want to farm next year, then I have to plan for that. And I have to treat my land and treat the ground properly so that I can farm next year. And, and I, I, I think every farmer does that. Our land is a, probably our greatest asset. If it doesn't get better all the time, I think that's a, a, a loss for us. I was probably practicing, you know, sustainable farming before I even knew what it was. It was very important to us to raise our children um, on a farm. I think it helps teach them responsibility, empathy, work ethic and every day they are involved in different ways. We got our goats last year. In April we had our first two babies and I named them June and Jasper. And right now they're weaning, that's why they're so loud. Weaning is just when they're old enough that they don't need to rely on their mom's milk as much and you just kind of wean them away from that. So right now I'm feeding them like their hay and their grain and getting them used to not drinking their mom's milk all the time. She's done a lot of research and it's these opportunities that we really wanted to give our children. So yeah, I think agriculture, if it's not the number one driver of economic activity in Dufferin County, it's pretty close. Um, there are a lot of farmers, a lot of different kind of farming. I mean, I'm a dairy farmer, but we've got beef farmers, we've got potato farmers, crop farmers, and then lots of little small farmers too. And, and I think we're all in it together. The other thing that we do is we add a lot to local communities. And I think that's important too, is that uh, farmers, we live here, we work here, we buy things here, and we support local communities. I think that's important. There are so many talented people, so many different farms. There's everything and anything you could want, you can find hidden in Dufferin County. This is an awesome job. You're gonna work your butt off, but it is so rewarding it's the kind of thing that you just don't get it without putting the time into it. This job is sexy. This job is fun. I'm, I'm here feeding people, which is, there's no better reward. If my kids keep going at it, then I've done my job.